Escaped Sapiens. The West produces roughly twice the number of calories that it needs per capita. In the face of climate change and an obesity epidemic, not to mention starvation in other parts of the world and the ethical problems surrounding industrial meat production, this appears to be a special kind of insanity. So how did we end up in our current economic mode, and is there a realistic way of breaking out of it? In this episode of the podcast, I speak with Marion Nessel, who is a professor of nutrition, food studies, public health, and sociology at New York University. This is a conversation about the way that corporate interests influence research, health policy, and advertisement to sculpt the food landscape within which consumers make their own free choices of what to eat. We discuss personal responsibility and the power of individuals, the fat acceptance movement, corporate lobbying, conflicts of interest in research funding, sustainability, and the food that is on your fork. I hope you enjoy. So welcome on the podcast, first of all. Thank you. My... To start with, just thinking about our food system, there's a number of different dystopian uh, economic modes I can imagine it functioning in. Uh, so, for example, I can imagine imagine a situation in which um, food companies push down supply in order to cause starvation and drive up demand and thereby getting profits. Um, but that's not the mode that we actually function in. In, in. in the West, we have a massive overproduction and... Um, you know, companies use lobbying and advertisement in order to uh, drive up uh, consumption. And then that's how they get their profits. And that's what causes, you know, obesity epidemics and damage to the environment, and this sort of thing. So to start with, how did we get into this particular eco economic mode? And was it inevitable? Well, I think it's called neoliberalism, isn't it? Uh, I mean, almost everyone who examines what's happened economically over the last 30 years starts with 90 or 40 years starts with 1980 um, because a lot of things happened in 1980 and i'm most familiar with the situation in the united states but this is a in some ways a worldwide phenomenon and in 1980 in the United States, uh, Ronald Reagan was elected as president with a de deregulatory agenda. And that deregulation um, allowed a lot of things to happen at the same time. Um, and those things, when you take them together, uh, can account for people eating more and therefore rising rates of obesity and the chronic diseases for which obesity is a risk factor. And the things that you know, I've noticed the most are an enormous overproduction of food um, that in, from 1980 to 2000, in that 20 year period, the number of calories available in the food supply per capita, men, women, little tiny babies, went from 3,200 to 4,000, an increase of 800 calories on average, bringing the calorie level in the food supply to twice what was actually needed. So there was a big increase of available food and the food industry had to sell it. And the so they were already competing in an environment in which um, there were too many calories and it was very competitive. It was made worse. I mean, that's bad for all corporations, but for food companies, it was made worse because at about the same time, early 1980s, we saw the advent of the shareholder value movement, which was a movement among stockholders to get higher, more immediate returns on investment. Prior to that, blue chip stocks were highly valued, you never hear about them anymore. Those were stocks that gave very, very long-term but slow returns on investment. And the shareholder value movement said, no, we want higher returns on our investment and we want them now. And so that put pressure on food companies, not only to make a profit, but they now had to grow their profits and report growth in profits to Wall Street every 90 days, a situation that was made impossible because there was already twice as much food available as anybody needed. And then there were deregulation, deregulations in um, restrictions on marketing. Uh, companies were allowed to market to children. In fact, any restrictions 
on marketing to children were eliminated by Congress in a law that said that no, um, the Federal Trade the, the Federal Trade Commission was not allowed to put any restrictions on marketing to children. The uh, Food and Drug Administration was forced by Congress in the early 1990s to uh, allow health claims on food products, which were ways of marketing foods better. And then food companies, in order to sell food in this environment, made it available everywhere in places where food had never been sold before, libraries, bookstores, clothing stores, foods everywhere. Um, and it became socially acceptable to eat food anywhere, any place, any time of day or night, and in very, very large portions. Portion sizes increase. And you, know, you want to account for obesity, all you have to do is look at portion size increases. I'm, I'm fond of saying that if I had one nutrition concept to get, I can't even say it with a straight face. If I had one nutrition concept to get across to the American public, it would be larger portions have more calories. Um, it's not intuitively obvious as it turns out. I mean, it sounds stupid, but it's not intuitively obvious. If you eat a larger portion, you're going to be taking in more calories. And the chances are you're not going to know that you're taking in more calories. To, to what extent does the oversupply, overproduction come from consumer choices? So, for example, when I go to the supermarket, I want to have everything available. And then uh, consumers, they don't pick the apple that has that spot on it. They, they want the perfect looking uh, piece of uh, fruit or vegetable. Is, is it those sorts of things that drives the oversupply? No, I don't think so. Um, I think it's marketing that drives the oversupply. Um, and also profits. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at federal agricultural policy, federal agricultural policy rewards corn and, corn and soybean producers for producing as much food as they possibly can. The more food they produce, uh, the more subsidies they get. And if you want to see the most ridiculous example of that, in my mind, um, think about how 40%, 40% of American corn is used for ethanol, fuel for cars. We don't grow food to feed people. We grow food to feed animals and to fuel automobiles. All the corn and soybeans aren't, that, those aren't going, a tiny proportion of them is going into consumer food products. Most of it is going to feed animals. So what, what decides which products the government is going to subsidize? Is, is, that, is that just lobbying or is there some... Of course it is. Of course it is. Um, you know, the, the really big agricultural producers pay a fortune to lobbyists to make sure that every single member of Congress in the House or the Senate is completely aware of the business problems of big agriculture um, and, much help with, and gets as much help with it as they can. You don't see um, apple and orange and broccoli and uh, snap pea producers getting anywhere near that kind of attention. In fact, fruits and vegetables have long been considered specialty crops. Uh, well, that's what they're called by the Department of Agriculture. They don't even count as food. They're these funny little things that people eat. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is about feeding animals. Um, and then in recent years, it's become about fueling automobiles. But so how, how did, for example, soybean manufacturers get into a position where they're powerful enough to lobby with deep pockets? You know, why, why is it that... Um, you know, corn was singled out as what, what was special about these crops in particular? Um, I think it's beef. Beef producers, the way it was once explained to me was that beef cattle are raised in every state in the union, all 50 states. There's cattle raising um, and every state has two sectors. So the beef industry drives this. Uh, and they're extremely powerful lobbyists. Beef is an American iconic food. 
Um, and they pay, spend a fortune on lobbyists to make sure that feed costs are low. If you want to keep feed costs low, you want feed overproduced, supply and demand. If there's a lot of it, it shouldn't cost much. Um, and they're really good at what they do. And there are beef producers in every state. So every senator uh, is quite familiar with the lobbyists for the beef industry. Say, for example, there was a company that suddenly became, you know, they changed the way they they saw uh, things and became slightly more moral and decided we want to make a difference. Talking about stockholders, shareholders, are companies legally bound to continue producing profits? Is is it is it just is it actually um, a legal requirement in in this case that? Uh, well, I'm not sure about the way the law is written, but it's interpreted as a legal requirement. Um, the absolute first priority of a food company is to produce profits for, stare, for shareholders if it's publicly traded. <clears throat> and I'm familiar with companies that are privately held. And the way they explain it is that there's the people who are members of the family or whoever has invested in their company also expects profits. Um, the more civic minded companies will tell me things like, well, we're privately held. So we have, you know, yes, our family members still expect us to make a lot of money, uh, but they're not quite as greedy as uh, the stockholders in privately held companies. So we have a little bit more room mm -hmm. to, to be more attentive to the needs of our community. Uh, purchasers. And, and I, I think, you know, I, I hear all the time, there was a big effort in 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, the World Economic Forum and the, some big business group conglomerate came out and said, we're changing the guidelines of our business. We are no longer going to say that our one and only priority is uh, to stockholder profits, we're going to have social values involved in that. And there were big announcements and full page ads in the New York Times, and they got enormous amounts of publicity for that. You saw no sign of it whatsoever during the pandemic. If that's what they were interested in, you saw no sign of it. And the way I explain it is uh, food companies are not social service agencies. They're not public health agencies. And to expect them to be either of those things is not to understand how the system works. Hmm. The system works to provide profits for stockholders. And from a stockholder position, that's what their investment is about. They're not interested in having the companies they're in, in, investing in be social service or public health agencies. That's not what they're investing for. So I think the system is set up so that no matter what the companies say, no matter how well-meaning they are, their hands are tied. If they're, not, if they're not growing their profits every 90 days, Wall Street gets very upset. <laughs> so in, in, in terms of advertising, usually when I see advertising on, I guess I don't really watch television anymore, but when I see advertising on the street, it's usually for something like McDonald's or Coca-Cola or something like this. You very rarely see broccoli advertisements and things like this. You know, if, if, if these products are really addictive and um, they, they get people, you know, sucked in and, and first of all, why, why do companies that are you know producing let, let's say junk products <laughs> why do they need advertising and on top of that why why can't if advertising works why can't it be used on products that are less destructive uh, for, for example yeah those are very good questions um advertising works there's plenty of evidence for that and the food industry spends 50 billion dollars a year in the united states to advertise products restaurants alcohol, um, grocery stores, whatever, it works. And if it works well, you don't notice it. 
paying attention to it is very unusual. It's supposed to slip below the radar of critical thinking. Coca-Cola wants the Coca-Cola logo in front of you all the time so that when you see it, some subliminal um, message works and say, mm, I think I want one of those. Mm. And they're everywhere. They're ubiquitous. And so they're pretty easy to find. Um, so, and, and they know it works. I mean, they hire all these people to study this kind of thing. They know more about consumer behavior than anybody else. Um, people, researchers are just catching up with what these companies already know about dietary habits and food choices. So that's the one thing. You said something about addiction. I, it's not a word I'm comfortable using about around food because we need to eat to live, um, but we don't need any one particular product to eat to live. We need to eat a wide variety of foods that have been relatively unprocessed um, and that will supply our nutrient needs. So the, the addiction is kind of, um, it kind of doesn't work for me, but I understand what it means. And plenty of people think they're addicted to one product or another, but what the, the companies that make what are now called the ultra processed foods, heavily processed foods that don't look like what they came from, that can't be made in home kitchens, um, are these products are formulated. Uh, again, I'm uncomfortable with the word addictive, but they're, the, the products are formulated to make you eat more of them. And we now have a extremely well-controlled clinical trial uh, done at the National Institutes of Health that shows that people who are fed diets that are based on highly processed foods eat more calories from those diets than when they're fed diets that are matched in every other way, except the degree of processing. Uh, and the number of the, the caloric difference is 500 a day. That's unbelievable. That's an enormous number. That's a pound a week of weight gain, which is what the subjects in that very well-controlled study gained. So we know from Michael Moss's work um, and his various books on sugar, salt, and fat, and whatever the most recent one is, I forget its title, but he demonstrates, he brings together all the literature on how those products are formulated to make people just want to eat them, not realize how much they're eating, and not realize how many calories they're taking in from them. And these products are enormously profitable because the basic ingredients are subsidized and are very cheap. And they can, and they're in boxes, so they're dry and last on the shelf for a long time. Um, I mean, that what every food company wants is an ultra-processed food that sits on a shelf and lasts forever. And and in answer to one of your other questions, another point: I was in a supermarket last week, and I and it was a supermarket with a, a lot of shelf space and. I was astounded at what ha what's happened to Cheerios. You know, when I was paying attention to cereals, uh, Cheerios was the box of cereal that you gave your kid because it was easy. The kids could chew on it and it dissolved in the mouth and was salty, but it wasn't heavily sugared. Um, there was at this particular supermarket, probably 40 feet of shelf space devoted to line extensions of Cheerios, chocolate Cheerios, Carmel Cheerios, fruit flavored Cheerios. There must have been 20 different kinds. I'm exaggerating somewhat, but I was astounded by the number of line extensions of Cheerios. Why does Cheerio do that? Because it gets 40 feet of shelf space instead of two. And the rule in supermarkets is that the more shelf space you get, the more people buy of your product. But I, I guess the, the question I'm curious, it might be a bit of a naive question, but why is it that advertising is coupled to these sorts of products as opposed to carrots or something? Like why? why if, if Oh, that's easy. Yeah. Uh, the carrots don't have any money. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, first of all, vegetables and fruits look at each other as competitors. They don't look at each other as 
one food. Every single fruit and vegetable has a trade association associated with it that is trying to get you to buy their product uh, more than every other one. So it's not something, uh, beef is easy. Be meat is meat, you can always advertise beef. And the particular products have an enormous amount of money behind them. Fruit and vegetable producers don't have that kind of money. I see. Just yeah. don't have it. There was an experiment um, to your point, there was an experiment during the Michelle Obama days when she was trying to improve the American diet where a, a fruit and vegetable company advertised baby carrots. And during the period that they were advertising baby carrots, sales increased. But then they stopped. I see. You know, that but wouldn't the, that be a good indication that maybe this is something they should be doing? If they could afford it, but they can't. I see. So the companies well, are just too small that are producing these particular goods. Yeah, you have to look at the advertising budgets of something like uh, McDonald's, a billion dollars a year in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, a, and that's just, that's just advertising that goes through advertising agencies where it can be tracked. It doesn't include all the other kinds of advertising they do. But there isn't a processed, a heavily processed food product that has an advertising budget less than $10 million a year. $10 million a year would be peanuts for one of those companies. Pop tarts, 30 million. Um, you know, a Gatorade, 100 million. I'm making those numbers up, but they're not that far off. The numbers are hard to come by. There occasionally you can find them in advertising age, but those those numbers are difficult to come by. But they're staggeringly large, and some you know some trade association for pecans can't afford to do that. They may have a couple of million dollars to spend. So what are they going to spend it on? They spend it on research to demonstrate that pecans are better than walnuts because they've got some nutrient in it that walnuts doesn't have. And the walnut people do exactly the same thing. The walnut people and the pecan people need to get together. And then <laughs> you would think, but they view each other as competitors. Hmm. So, so in terms of advertisement, is it really directed at, so let, let's look at Coke because it's an e easy example. Is the advertisement really directed at me, because I, I know what Coke is. I, I've, I've known about it for years. Um, is, is the advertisement directed at me or is it primarily addressed towards children and people who haven't seen the product before? No, it's directed to your emotions. It's not directed to you at all. It's directed to something that you react emotionally to. Um, and you may not even be aware of it. In fact, you're not supposed to be aware of it. You're not supposed to realize what you're being marketed to, but if you look at Coca-Cola advertising on television, particularly, the ads are touching. They really are. They're sweet. They show families meeting together. They show sports figures. They show music figures. Um, if you go to Coca-Cola World in Atlanta, the first thing you see is a video, and there isn't a person who watches that video who comes out with dry eyes. Um, they have learned how to reach you in a way that you're not conscious of, hmm. um, to give you a feeling that this is something you're going to like and that's going to make you feel good. So is it an illusion that the customer or the consumer really has the main choice when it comes to what they're eating? Well, the choice is influenced. There's an enormous influence on that choice. If you go, or something that I like to do, I go online and I type in, what are the major influences on food choice? And I'm fascinated to see that culture, personal preference, how much money you have, what kind of religion you have, what your family background is, all of these very, very personal things come up and you never see food industry marketing mentioned. You just never see it. It's as if it doesn't exist when in fact it's the elephant in the room. And remember these companies are spending tens of billion dollars a year 
Mm-hmm. You know, the, again, these numbers are very hard to come by, but I think $50 billion a year is not far off. Uh, if, you, if you look at food restaurant and alcohol companies combined, um, which is the way they do that. It's, you know, I was just billions and billions and billions of dollars are being spent to try to get you to buy their products. But, but nonetheless, our choices are important, right? I mean, well, you know, it, we, we, <laughs> there is a back reaction on, on the, you know, the, the, the companies themselves, they use advertisement to change the way that we behave. And I suppose the way that we behave also influences what they're able to sell to a large extent. Yeah, I mean, you can boycott products and say you're not going to buy something. But every single time you buy something, you're making a choice about the kind of food system you want, the values that you care about. And you're not supposed to go into a supermarket and think about those things. You're just supposed to go in and buy. And the more impulse buying you do, the better it is for the supermarket. And they're all set up to encourage impulse buying. Um, So we go in thinking that, you know, we have all this choice. We have all these choice of 25 different kinds of Cheerios. Is that a real choice? You're still buying Cheerios. It's still a junk food. So with that in mind, when it comes to, you know, agency and personal responsibility, what are your thoughts on movements like the fat acceptance movement, for example? Well, that's, um, that has to do with stigma about obesity, and I'm uh, greatly opposed to stigmatizing people who these days, as they put it, have obesity, uh, because the yes, it's the way they eat, but they're in a food environment that is deliberately set up to get people to eat as much as they possibly can as many times a day as possible in as large as portions as possible in as many places as possible the entire food environment is set up that way it's a minefield Um, and for people you know i mean i'm old so i don't i can't eat very much anymore right my metabolism is slowed down to zero I'm astounded at how little I eat. Um, and yet there's food around all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have, you know, I have to deal with that food that's around all the time in portions that are way bigger than I could possibly manage. And for somebody who can eat and who really is able to take in a lot of calories the way I used to be able to, it's a minefield. And so the real question is, what do you do to create a food environment that promotes healthier eating? That's the big public health conundrum these days. So in terms of setting policy, I mean, the food system is really pretty complicated. You have all different interests from all different groups. So are there any conflicts that are completely not obvious from the point of view of a consumer that that, uh, stopping good health policy being brought into effect? Well, I think the research conflicts of interest, uh, when so much of food industry research is um, paid for by the companies that directly benefit from the outcome of the research. I wrote a book about that. Um, you know, so it's a big issue for me. And I was amazed at, uh, that these, uh, this kind of thing is so blatant. You know, I mean, it was most obvious with Coca-Cola, which was paying investigators to uh, do research demonstrating that it doesn't matter what you eat. Uh, it, what your weight is has nothing to do with what you eat. It's how physically active you are. Well, I'm greatly in favor of physical activity, but if you want to lose weight, it's very hard to do it with physical activity. You have to eat less. And the question is, how do you eat less in this kind of food environment? It's really tough. But so what sort of impact does that research actually have at the consumer level? Yeah, you know, I see, for example, on packets that this has more vitamins in it or this product here has more calcium or whatever. Do we actually need those things that are being put into the packaging or, or you know, are there things that are being sold as being healthy that are very much not or where what's being touted as healthy is pretty much irrelevant for us? Well, anytime you see a big health claim on a food product, particularly a product that's highly processed, has a long ingredient list, 
um, you know, there used to be a lot of antioxidant advertising and there still is, um, but there's very little evidence that healthy people are more healthy by eating antioxidants. And certainly Americans are not vitamin deprived. Uh, the big problem in the American diet is eating too much. Um, and it's a very hard one to solve because eating is one of life's greatest pleasures. And I'm not one to deny anybody that kind of pleasure. I love to eat. I think food is fabulous. And, the, um, and so the real problem is how <clears throat> you as an individual can fight an entire food system on your own. I think it's an unfair battle. I suppose also when it comes to antioxidants and other, there are all these fads that come out, right? You, you hear one year that eggs are good or bad and you should take this or you should eat this superfood or walnuts cure everything. Um, is is the science, this is completely outside of my field, so I've got no idea. Is, is the science actually changing or is the science more or less stable around, you know, people more or less agree what is healthy. It's pretty much stable. And the, the, the switching opinions are sort of artifacts of the media, and, or, or is there really a shift that's happening at the level of the science as well? Well, I don't see much of a shift, I have to say. Um, the, there were dietary guidelines published in the 1950s for chronic disease prevention that looked just like the dietary guidelines for, the, for Americans that came out last year. Uh, I mean, they're really not that much different. The, uh, you know, there are lots of arguments about carbohydrates versus fat. Nobody wants to talk about calories, uh, you know, which is one of the really interesting things. You can't see calories, you can't taste them. You don't know that they're there. You certainly can't count them. Uh, so nobody wants to talk about calories. Everybody wants to talk about carbohydrates versus fats. Uh, and you know, the, uh, what the studies are showing Again, carbohydrate and fat are in a context of calories. The biggest problem, I'm going to say it again, the biggest problem in the American diet is eating too much. And so if you, a carbo, I would argue that carbohydrates and fats matter much, much less if you're not overeating calories. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there, there's research that sort of changes one or the other, but the big point is that people are eating too many calories and there's tons of research to back that up. And people would be healthier if they didn't eat so many calories, didn't overeat them to such an extent, but it's really hard for an individual to cut down on calories in a food environment in which food is available everywhere in large portions. In terms of the research that's being done and funded. One other thing, I'm sorry, one other thing, sure. it's cheap. Food is cheap in the United States. And I'm not gonna argue against cheap food because cheap food means that everybody can afford to eat, which is a good thing. I don't want people starving on the streets. I really don't. It's actually unbelievable. If you grow your own food at all, you know you, you have your cherry tree out the back and you see how long it takes to produce food. It's amazing that people can sell a zucchini for a dollar. Or it's unbelievably ch cheap, the food that we have access to, really. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've got a garden on my terrace in Manhattan and a place upstate. And I'm uh, our big problem is it produces too much. And then what do you do with it? So that's a supply and demand problem. You can't even give away the zucchini. You know, but could you survive off it? Probably not, right? Well, I, mean, I don't know. We don't buy vegetables in the summer. I'll tell you that. But the, um, you know, I mean, food is... If you, even a pot is very can be very productive, but the supermarket food, you know, for people who don't have any money, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who do have money, it's really not expensive at all. And but that's a that's a political problem. You know, if you want people who don't have enough money to eat healthily, you got to give them money. Um, uh, it seems to me to be the easiest way to do that. So, so back at the research level, should is this is it companies have their own research scientists that are pushing this out, or is it people at universities that are just being funded by? And okay, so it, it seems like it's the second. So, should researchers be accepting money from companies at all, or should there be sort of a moratorium put on 
Well, well let, let me start with the research question. Uh, food companies used to have their own, big food companies used to have their own research staff. And Nestle, no relation, Unilever still do, but practically everybody else gave them up. And so if they want research done, they send out a request for proposals. I get these all the time. And they say, we're looking for research to demonstrate the benefits of our product. It's that bald. Um, well, I can design a study to demonstrate the benefits of your product. It's not very hard to do that. If you've done a lot of research, you know how to design studies that are likely to give you the answer that you want. Um, I don't consider that science. I consider that marketing research. And there's a lot of it around. Um, so yes, faculty take money from food companies and so people don't see anything wrong with that because they feel as if they're not being influenced by the funding. And there has been a great deal of research to look at what's called the funding effect, which is the term that's used to describe the fact, the observed fact that um, industry funded studies tend to come out with results that favor the sponsor's interest. What a coincidence. Surprise. They don't always, but most of the time they do, or they very often do. And the other part of that is that the investigators who received the funding did not intend to be influenced. They don't recognize the influence and they deny the influence. Um, so what I hear when I talk about my book, Unsavory Truth, how the food industry you know, influences the science of, you know, of nutrition and health. Um, when I talk about that book, researchers say, why aren't you talking about science? Why are you talking about influence? Why aren't you just talking about the science? Is the science okay? Well, the science may be okay. How the studies were done is really irrelevant in this. They're usually done pretty well. But how come they so often come out with results that favor the sponsor's interest? Um, it's very hard not to see or to, to have these studies appear as if the funders are getting what they pay for. And certainly if they are asking for studies that will show benefit, they are not likely to fund a study that is not likely to show benefit. Mm. So the system is set up and there's research about how this happens. It's in the way the research question is asked, mostly, or the way it's interpreted. What sort of worries me about this is in America, I guess all the West at the moment, there's sort of this um, anti-science sentiment that you you see sort of across across the board on both sides of politics. And I wonder what influence this sort of, you know, this sort of funding has on driving uh, further skepticism. You know, I think most people don't know about it. It's pretty well hidden. Um, reporters writing about research studies rarely say who funded them. I hope that my book would encourage reporters writing about research to always look to see who funded it. Um, and some are getting better than others, but it's, uh, it's not something that the public would know about because unless you read the original research paper, you would have no way of knowing who the funder was. Hmm. So I, I think the distrust of science comes from conflicting studies from not understanding that science moves um, and because there are people who have very firm views about, uh, about particularly nutrition science and are unbudgeable, even in the face of tremendous amounts of evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. But so at risk of uh, adding to that sort of uh, way of thinking, when what would you recommend for people who who are completely so the lay person who who reads an article saying you know blueberries make you grow twice as fast when you're a kid or whatever whatever the claim is would you recommend just to completely 
not listen to those sort of claims? Is it, it, it... No, I, I think you want to be skeptical. If a claim sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I mean, I have a list of things that uh, I think people should look for. My favorite being everything you thought you knew about nutrition was wrong. Anytime you hear that a red flag should go up on the field um, and your skeptical tentacles should come out because that's not how science works. Um, and, you know, I mean, there are things that you can look for. Who were the researchers? Did they have a vested interest in the outcome? Was it industry funded? But mostly, does it make sense? You know, use common sense. Does the result make sense? Does it, is it plausible? And, you know, if you, if you think, oh, I wish that were true, that may be, you know, that's nice, but let's wait for another study. And, and uh, so skepticism, I think, is very much in order. Uh, the reason I ask is, um, you know, if, if the obvious comparison is uh, sort of the research that was done, done by cigarette companies back in the day. Mm -hmm. do, do you think, um, so how does the, ep the obesity epidemic compare to uh, earlier problems that were caused by uh, smoking? And do you think that companies will be held? I know there's already there are companies that have been sued, and and people have bought various actions against places like McDonald's and so forth. But um, do you think we're ever going to have sort of legal action at the same level as what happened uh, towards cigarette companies when it comes to no, food is too complicated. You know, with cigarettes, it's one product and one message. Don't smoke. Really straightforward. With food, it's much more complicated. Uh, you have to eat to live, first of all. Um, you can't not eat. And, the, and so your choices are uh, to choose this food instead of that food or to change the amount of food that you're eating. You, but you've got to, you have, you're in the system. You can't not be in the system. So the... Uh, the messages are more complicated, eat this instead of that or eat less. Um, and the companies are trying to sell their products in, in an environment in which there's twice as many calories as anybody needs. So it's a mess. What the food companies have adopted wholesale is the tactics of the cigarette companies. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you do is to blame personal responsibility. Number two is you cast doubt on, on the research. Um, you say, well, the research doesn't really prove that there's anything wrong with sugar, right? I mean, you know, and, and it's your choice anyway. Um, and so on down the line. And the, the, the cigarette companies had what is referred to as the marketing playbook. Hmm. And food companies follow exactly the same playbook. Hmm. At risk of sounding a little bit naive, do you think, this is to some extent, uh, you know, the, the obesity epidemic. Do you think this is to some extent, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be flippant, but sort of teething issues. You know, we have, we have where it's very young in human history that we've had the technology to, to have such abundance. And um, do, you, do you think we're going to get into a point where the damage that's caused is so great, the, the, the um, social damage due to uh, diabetes, disease, and other effects will necessarily force uh, the issue and, and force us back into a, a more healthy path? Or do you think this is something that can be pushed further and further and further uh, inside the current paradigm with no real end if no action is taken? Well, we're, really, we're already at the stage where three quarters of American adults are overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. Quarters, seventy. What's well, seventy-four percent according to the CDC? So I mean, this is now the American norm, and I see no action whatsoever to try to do anything about it. Because if you do take action, you have to do something about the food industry, and nobody is willing to take that on. Hmm. There's no political will to take that on that I can see. Mm -hmm. So do you um, think? 
Well, I'm sorry. Say, in a sense, America is almost unique in that because there are countries all over the world that are in a complete panic about rising rates of overweight in their populations because they can see the close correlation between overweight and type 2 diabetes. They know it's coming. And type 2 diabetes is a terrible disease to have to treat. It requires drugs. It requires, you know, it leads to amputations and um, it's a risk factor for heart disease. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. You end up with an unhealthy population. And we saw that during the COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst of the COVID is the people who were most susceptible to the bad outcomes from COVID were people with uh, pre-existing chronic diseases, many of them related to being overweight or obese. So, you know, this is not, uh, so we're already in a crisis. Mm -hmm. So, so are there uh, policy differences between the way that things are done in the States as, as opposed to the rest of the West that you can pick out and say that is, that is a difference that occurs in, in the States that leads to uh, this particular outcome? Is there, is there one or two things that you could point to that are particularly uh, problematic? I'm not sure I understand the question, but there, there are countries in Latin America that are passing laws to restrict marketing, particularly marketing to children, um, that are taxing junk foods, that are taxing sodas, putting warning labels on ultra-processed foods. These are happening throughout Latin America. Um, and there are warning labels on uh, various countries in Europe are starting to adopt warning labels. Israel has some. I mean, there aren't a lot of countries that are doing this, but these countries are really, really concerned about what the future holds uh, if you have a population of overweight people. And, and uh, are these policies that are being implemented uh, successful? Uh, uh, are there big success stories that are taking place? Well, I think big success is hard because uh, overweight is a complicated, there are lots of reasons why people are, over, are overweight. And there are many, many things you have to do if you want to do something about that. Um, but what I keep reminding everybody about is that we had people who were overweight or obese prior to 1980. But the real increase in prevalence of obesity occurred between 1980 and 2000, just when calories were going up in the food supply. Genetics didn't change. Metabolism didn't change. Um, what changed was people were eating more. Mm -hmm. Now, there were many factors that encouraged people to eat more. Changing just one is unlikely to fix it, except in a small way. I mean, I think there are things you could do that would make a very big difference. You could feed kids in school more healthfully um, if you had the political will to do that. Like Mrs. Obama's uh, policies that she was putting yeah, to place. And it, uh, even going even further than that. And there are certainly studies that show that states with healthier school lunches, school lunch programs have less... Um, obesity among children than states that have loose school lunch programs, but you don't know whether those are due to other factors as well. Because all of these, these because factors track um, poverty, lack of education, poor diets, that they track. Um, and so do you suspect that the, um, the solution is really gonna be primarily at the policy level, or do you think, I imagine it's not the case, but do you think that, uh, for example, there could be um, new technologies that come into play that allow populations to address obesity issues without making policy changes or uh, without making behavior changes? So for example, maybe this is synthetic meat that uh, is healthier or maybe GMOs. I imagine you're going to say no to this, but I thought I'd ask it in any case. I'm laughing. Um, the, uh, I think technological solutions are very unlikely to be helpful because we're talking about calories. Um, if you're talking about obesity, you're talking about calories, uh, which nobody wants to talk about, but you have to. 
so that's you know, you know big, everybody gets very upset if you say the solution to to the obesity problem is to eat less and move more. That is in fact the solution. The question, the real problem is how you do that. How do you do that in the kind of environment that we now have, which is a very sedentary environment on the physical activity side, and a hugely overabundant environment on the calorie intake side so but you know what, what what could you do you could have a pill that would make people not hungry so they wouldn't eat mm, that pill is going to have side effects that will turn out to be difficult um i can't think of one i mean we could talk about fake meats they still have calories so um, so is the question somehow it, it sounds like the question it one thing with food that's different to my research is everyone eats food. So everyone has some sort of a handle on it. Whereas there are fields like particle theory or mathematics or wherever you're in where the average person doesn't have an opinion, let's say. Um, so d d is it frustrating to have to remind people that calories are important? I mean, this is, this is uh, I imagine my, my question might have been uh, frustrating to hear, uh, maybe. I have a low, I have a high frustration tolerance. So I wouldn't be able to be in this business. Um, no, I think it's what I try to do is to talk about what the reality is and try not to get bogged down. It's not only that everybody has a handle on nutrition and food issues. They have really strong opinions about them. Mm -hmm. Strong belief systems strong, I, I mean, I would say relatively in the same category as religion, you know, the kind of the strength of belief that goes along with religion, you have the same level of strength of belief going along with food. And just as you cannot talk to people about what's wrong with their religion, if you don't happen to agree with, with religion, most people learn pretty pretty quickly, not to argue with people about religion because it gets you nowhere. Um, I learned pretty quickly not to argue with people about food mm -hmm. because they have their belief systems and nothing I say is going to change their belief system. Um, but, you know, you know, I mean, results show. I wrote a book called Soda Politics a few years ago um, that was not a diet book. It was a book about how Coca-Cola sells Coca-Cola and what you can do about it and how various advocacy groups have worked to try to encourage people to drink less soda, which has been a fairly successful public health campaign. People are drinking less soda. I mean, that's actually happened and sugar intake is down as a result. So that's you know, something that worked. The book is titled, um, soda politics, how to take on big soda and win. Um, so the, it was, um, it was meant to be an advocacy manual, how to do advocacy around soda issues. I got, um, letters from people afterwards saying, I read your book and I lost 10 pounds. I read your book and I lost 20 pounds. I read your book and I lost 40 pounds. The record was 80. I read your book and I lost 80 pounds, making only one dietary change. Hmm. Stop, no sugary drinks. Cutting out the sugary drinks. Well, that tells me a lot. Hmm. I think that's enlightening. And I tell that story. The first thing you do if you want to lose weight is to look at the sugary drinks you're drinking and stop drinking them. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who wrote me swore that they made no other changes. That must be really, it must be really nice when you have happy people writing to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, oh, I was stunned, absolutely stunned. I hadn't written it as a diet book. So on no. the technology, sorry, sorry, I just interrupted you. Well, you say the whole book is about why you shouldn't drink soda, but uh, it never occurred to me that people would take it as, okay, let's try that. And boy, does it ever work. <laughs> so on the, on the topic of technology, um, I'm just a bit curious about uh, your opinion on this. So GMOs, I, I personally have no problems with GMOs, but one of the things that is 
I, I might be wrong about this, but I, my impression is that one of the problems with GMOs is that your local farmer doesn't often implement novel GMO solutions. It's, it's big industries, uh, institutions and corporations that have the money, the researchers that are able to actually put out uh, modified crops or modified products. So is, is there a way that you see that, that GMOs can come in without some of the problems that uh, might be associated with the corporate infrastructure that's attached to them? And uh, do you see them as, as having a big part in the future of food? Well, the, the GMO issue is interesting because um, they were a technological solution to a social problem or they were being used that way. First of all, we already have more corn and soybeans than we possibly need, right? Um, so we didn't have a dearth of corn and soybeans and the GMO technology, which can only be used by wealthy farmers because you have to buy the seeds every year. You can't save seeds, it's against the law. Um, and you get into big trouble if you save seeds. So it's not appropriate for small farmers who are saving seeds that don't have a lot of money. The GMO companies would love to get into Africa and, and get these small farmers to use their technology. But once they do, they go out of business because they can't manage the fees and they're not growing food to feed their family. They really need to be growing food to feed their family. And if they were doing it right, they would have a few crops to sell so they would bring in some cash and could send their kids to school. But mostly they have to feed their family a balanced diet. Um, so, the GMO issue is all about corporate control. That's what it was from the very beginning. It was never about feeding the world. It was never about saving, you know, ending world hunger. It may have been advertised like that, but it was really about selling patented seeds to farmers um, and selling patented seeds to farmers who then have to use the chemicals that go with those seeds to kill weeds. Um, and you see where we are with that, where uh, the, where Roundup, you know, weeds are resistant to Roundup. So Roundup's not nearly as useful as it used to be for killing weeds. And it's now been associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the courts have ruled in favor of plaintiffs and it's cost buyer, which bought Monsanto, billions and billions of dollars in legal costs. Um, and it's not over yet. And I guess every time you find a problem with any particular production and there's legal action, there's the next one in line being produced. Do, do you see, do you see, is there a good path that we can go down in your opinion uh, with regards to GMOs? Um, it, it, it's, it's from what, from what I'm reading, it, it it's still in your mind. It's the it's not the technology that you have a problem with. It's really the corporate infrastructure. From from what oh, I've, absolutely. yeah. Um, it, is it, so is is there a path where this technology can be used in in a positive way in in your mind? Well, I don't see how. I mean, in theory, yes, but I don't see how in practice, because the technology was never used in any serious way for food for people. It was used for food for animals. Corn and soybeans are for animals, right? I mean, the, the big genetically modified crops are corn, soybeans, canola, sugar beets. Um, if you go into a supermarket, there's hardly anything there that's genetically modified. Papayas from Hawaii. I, you know, I would argue that the genetic modification of the Papaya to resist ring spot virus was useful. That was useful. Um, but, you know, was it necessary? I don't know. There are big arguments about it, but I thought that was useful. But that's Hawaiian papayas. Mm. That's not feeding the world. And that's not making a huge amount of money for very many people. Corn and soybeans is where the money is because it feeds cattle. It feeds chickens. It feeds pigs. Um, and so that's what you want. You want the, uh, the technology has been used 
for crops that will make lots of money for the corporations. And then those crops, because they're patented, there's all kinds of legal stuff about heaven help you if you save seeds, you're in big trouble. Um, and it's not encouraging what everybody thinks is the solution to world hunger and climate change at the same time, which is what is now called regenerative agriculture, where you're growing, where you're growing crops under conditions in which you're not using a lot of inputs um, and you're returning the nutrients to the soil. Um, and nobody makes money off of that. Big so, problem. So do you see do you see some of these technological solutions as sort of like a red herring? Like, so I said, for example, um, you know, does synthetic meat give you some new uh, pathway for solving problem X? So maybe that's going to be better for the environment. Say, do do you see do you see the these technologies really? It it sounds as though. I mean, you've already said this. So I'm just asking it again, though. So it sounds like really the technology has to take a backseat to a systematic problem that we have in the way that we organize our uh, food system. Well, I would put it this way: the three biggest nutrition, the, the three biggest nutrition and food problems in the world today are not having enough food, having too much food, and eating too much of the wrong kind of food, and the effect of agriculture on climate change. Those are the big three. Those are social problems. They're social and economic problems. They're not technical problems. So to have a technical solution to them is not likely to work. You have to solve the societal issues in order to fix those problems. I mean, look at the problem. We've known about climate change for a very long time, right? And all these documents are coming out that the oil industry knew about climate change more than 50 years ago and has done everything it possibly could to suppress knowledge of climate change. But certainly within the last 10 or 15 years, the nobody, there isn't anybody who's interested in this who doesn't realize that we are facing just a horrendous problem. You can see it in your own backyard if you've got a backyard, that here we are, and I don't know, we're talking at the, at the beginning of November at this in this particular interview, and it's warm out. Hmm. You know, I, I, I lived on the East Coast 30 years ago when um, it froze October 15th and didn't thaw until March. You know, I mean, Things that didn't bloom are in bloom. I've got Prescythian bloom now. The, the, uh, you can't miss it if you're paying any attention to it. Um, we know what we need to do, and yet there's no political will to do it. Look at what's going on now in the conferences that they're having. Nobody wants to stop using oil, using gas, giving up uh, what they're already doing. Can I ask, is is the playing field just completely broken in a sense? So, so you're a researcher and let's say you wanted to push policy or you wanted to lobby for some direction. You don't have enormous, in fact, researchers ask for money for their, <laughs> for their research. So, so how do, uh, this is completely out of my, my field. I, I don't understand how these things are uh, generated. So, so when, when there is a policy change or policies put into play, what sort of controls, what levers do the, um, do the big corporations have to actually pull? And, and what levers do you and, and, and people who are making um, uh, health policies and uh, sorry, uh, sort of health advisors, what, what sort of levers do they have? Uh, so how does that system work? Well, the issue is who has the power? You know, we saw food power, we saw the power of food companies in action during the COVID pandemic when the big meat packing firms went to the president and wrote the president's executive order, keeping the meat packing plants open, even though everybody in the plants was getting sick and taking that sickness into their communities. Um, we saw that in you know, one of the starkest examples of corporate power in action and government 
you know, corporate control over government in action that I've seen in a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, ProPublica got found emails that demonstrated that the meatpacking companies wrote the president's executive order. That's a government that's captured by corporations. And they're able to make, they're able to directly write that sort of, um, uh, they're able to do that because they fund uh, the election or what? what, what sure. It- sure. I mean, they give election campaign con- contributions and they're meat companies. Uh, meat is an American icon. Mm-hmm. You know, who could possibly be against that? Um, and then this was an example of raw political power in which thousands of meatpacking workers crammed together, many of them immigrants, many of them people of color, crammed together uh, in these plants, unable to not work because they got fined if they didn't come in. They were told to come in and work while they were sick. And COVID is spreading all over the place. And they're taking it home into their communities. All of this now thoroughly documented with a report from a House committee that just came out last week talking about how the number of cases and deaths were greatly undercounted last year. Three times higher than what anybody thought, and it was already pretty high. So that's corporate power in action. So what can I as an individual do about that? I can go and ask him to have a meeting with the president. Am I likely to get one? The head of Tyson's got one. Um, I can go and visit my congressional representatives. I can write letters. I can get other people to come with me. I can organize um, demonstrations. I mean, there are things I can do uh, and there are things that citizens can do, but we have very weak civil society in the United States. We don't have strong civil society where citizens have a very strong voice. We have lots and lots and lots of terrific organizations working on food issues, but they're not organized politically. They're not organized to take political action there, there are no really, really, really strong coalitions. Unions have been destroyed and are only just starting to come back um, as you know, people in these low wage work situations are just saying, we're not going to do it unless you pay me more. So you know, we'll see how this plays out. But until we get a stronger civil society, or a government that is less beholden to corporations. And we put some regulations on corporations so they don't have as much power. I don't see the system changing. And those are the things I think we need to work for. We need to overturn Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that allowed unlimited money to go into election campaigns. We have to do something about voting rights in this in this country and bring back voting rights so that we have citizens who can at least vote. Um, and there's a reason why voting rights have been taken away from so many people. That has to do with power. So how do you get power back to people? Um, and people are going to disagree. I don't expect everybody to agree with the way I see things or to agree with me, but at least get let's get some kind of honest expression of what people really think. We don't have that now. I, I want to um, uh, move towards a conclusion where, where I asked you about uh, the path forward, but I, I the, your answer makes me a little bit curious. I, I, I'm, I'd, I'd like to know, is with with what you've said in mind is there some something that you've done in your career um or is there some outcome that you've achieved that you're particularly proud of um in face of these sort of difficulties oh they're personal things they're personal things i mean the books that i've written um the field of food studies which i was lucky enough to be in a department that could invent Um, We invented a whole new academic field of study. The library at New York University where I work, um, just an extraordinary food library. 
of resources and documents and papers that scholars from all over the world can come in and use. Um, you know, have I changed the world politically? I don't know. I'd like to think that my work has um, brought the food industry out of the closet or it's more visible. Uh, when I wrote my book, Food Politics in 2002, uh, I was asked all the time, what does food have to do with politics? You know, I, don't, I still get asked that, but not nearly as often. And at the time that I wrote the book, people were astounded. Really? The food industry tries to influence food choice? When it seemed so obvious to me, I thought I was just stating the obvious. But nobody else was looking at the time. Nobody else was really looking at what food companies were doing to try to manipulate food choices in a way to get people to eat more. But that was what was happening. And I, you know, I don't think that the food company people are evil. I really don't. This is all in the normal course of doing business. So, so if you had a, if you had to draw out. Um... You know, if you had your dream for the way that the food system should run, you know, what would it look like? Are we able to solve obesity? Are we able to solve uh, malnutrition? Are we able to protect the planet? Are we able to get rid of battery farms? If, if, if you had your, you know, uh, overview of, of what the food system looks like, what, what's that picture? Well, I would start by saying that we need to decide what our goals are. Um, and I would like the goals to be public health that the entire food system should be set up to promote public health and the entire food system should be set up to promote agricultural sustainability and reduce carbon emissions. Um, because agriculture is responsible for, oh, everybody's gonna argue about the percentage, but let's say 15 to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, depending on what you count in that. I just saw a paper that fertilizers are responsible for a third of the greenhouse gas emissions um, that are attributed to agriculture. So we start with the policy and the policies that I want to see would be to reduce hunger, to reduce chronic disease and uh, the chronic diseases that are related to being overweight and to reduce climate change. These, are, I, I think, are the big three that have to be done right away. Well, if you decide that those are your goals, then you start looking at your agricultural policies. And the first thing you want to do is start having agricultural policies that will promote food for people, uh, not so much for profit, <laughs> um, right? And where the, let's have subsidies for healthy foods. Mm -hmm. that are going to make healthy foods cheaper and more available so that people can afford them. Let's do something about nutrition and food education in schools so everybody who goes to school learns how to grow and prepare food. Um, you know, that's at least so the young people will start coming through knowing more about this. Let's reward regenerative agricultural methods, conservation methods, growing less food rather than more because more isn't the issue. Quality is the issue. Let's, let's produce quality food. Um, and then have an educational system, an agriculture system, a food system that is all set up to do that and rewards health and sustainability. Um, what, what are the options, you know, what are the problem? What's the probability of that? I don't, I don't imagine it's going to be in my lifetime. Maybe in mine. <laughs> oh, so. wouldn't that be good? <laughs> Marion, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been really amazing. No, oh, my pleasure. Escaped Sapiens.